So I'm going to use a metaphor to bring this idea to life of a three-act play. And I actually really like this metaphor. I'm actually stealing it from a guy at Groupon who spoke to my class this semester. And I really liked his metaphor for startups are essentially done in a three-act play. And your first act is essentially you need to do your character development, which for me has come up with your idea. Then what you need to do is do your plot development, which essentially means execute on your idea. And then the third phase is some sort of resolution, which for me is to really kind of have some ruthless clarity about, you know, what was the real outcome or impact of the, the, the work that you've been doing for so long and working so hard at. So for me, uh, how do we come up with the idea? <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you guys are laughing. You know, when Chris said he needed a complicated algorithm, I turned to Nicole and I said, I've got that algorithm. <laughs> So I think that lots of people have lots of ideas, but what we really have to do is think carefully, carefully about validating the value of that idea before we pour ourselves into it. And so this notion of validating your idea, I think, could be done quantitatively through a very complicated algorithm of due diligence. Um, and for those of my students in the room, you know that I really love mathematical formulas and algorithms to explain things. I see some of you laughing at me. But it, it boils down to four simple things in my mind to validate the, um, the possible merit of your idea. As a marketing person, I really think that if you can't clearly identify a customer need in the marketplace that your idea solves, I think that's a deal breaker and you should stop. And although I teach technology marketing and I know there's a lot of scientific discoveries that we don't know where the market value is for the discovery, I think that's going to be a really long and painful process, and I think you just have to know that going in. If you don't identify a market need to start with, you're going to have a pretty painful process. The second thing from my perspective is you have to have a sense of your own capabilities to actually fill that need. And this is a really hard one because um, it's almost as if you have to have a little bit of overinflative confidence to actually think, well, I can do that. And then later on in the process, you'll find, what was I thinking that I could actually do that? You know, what kind of hubris was that? But I think if you don't at the outset have this kind of, and really it's more than confidence, I think it's a little overinflated sense of confidence that you're sort of betting on the come that you can actually do something like this. And, and I don't know what that says about people who bring ideas to life, but I think that's uh, part of the character or the quality. Um, as a marketing person, I think you have to be very familiar with the competitive landscape. And I'm going to talk more about that in the context of my textbook in just a minute. And then uh, you have to know how you're actually going to deliver this product in the marketplace because products don't deliver themselves to customers. You have to have a strategy and energy and money behind it. And if you don't have a go-to-market strategy, it doesn't matter how great your idea is, it's just going to die on the vine. So in terms of the, the textbook market, for me, the idea for the textbook actually came at a conference where academics get together in a room and they kind of do their nerdy thing where they're talking, you know, academic jargon to each other. And in 1998, a lot of us were talking about, well, how do you teach technology marketing and what resources do you use and what readings are you assigning and what cases do you use? And everybody said, God, we need a textbook to make this subject a little bit easier. And I'm looking around the table, and all of a sudden I realize my hand is in the air saying, I can write that textbook. And I thought, what was I thinking? But the fact is, there was a real market need, and I was aware of that, and I was in a room with people who all were expressing the same need. And I really thought I was at an institution where they would actually support my efforts to write a textbook, because it's not a uniformly desirable activity for academics at other schools to actually say they write textbooks. And that's a reality. Um, the competitive landscape, there were no textbooks available for people who taught technology marketing. So there, you know, what do inventors say? Oh, my idea is so great, there's no competition. Well, the reality is there were a lot of trade books and business books on technology marketing. Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm was kind of the Bible in Silicon Valley, and if a professor wanted to, they could have used that book or they can assign a fact pack or readings from the Harvard Business Review. So there was a lot of indirect competition. And I think it's really important to know how you're going to position your product against the indirect competition, because that's what customers are going to be switching from. You have to be real clear on what your value is going to be. 
And my go-to-market strategy for academic textbooks is essentially to find a publisher. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute because I think the lessons in finding a publisher are very similar to how do you find distribution channel partners, how do you find business partners, how do you find financial backers or angel investors. So I think the go-to-market strategy that I'm going to talk about has some generalized, uh, generalizable lessons. The textbook market has changed significantly, and I don't think you actually need a publisher any longer. You can do self-publishing, there are e-books, there are lots of possibilities. And so I think you should know at the outset that I, kind of my, my idea here of finding a publisher is because I started this process about 12 years ago. And if I had to redo it, I might do it differently at this point in time. Okay, I already talked about uh, you know, what the need was, but for me to find a publisher, I had to write a prospectus. And I sent the prospectus to five different textbook publishers. And the way that they made a decision about the viability of my idea was how clearly I could communicate in the prospectus what the idea was, and importantly, what the size of the market was that they would be selling books into. And in order to get that data, I actually conducted a quantitative survey that I mailed a survey to marketing professors across the country and asked them, does your university teach this course? How many students does it have? How many sections do you have? How many times a year do you have it? What teaching materials are you currently using? Would you consider using a book? And I was able to analyze the data from that survey and include it in my prospectus. And on the basis of that, I was able to give a range of the market size for these publishers. And I'll tell you, I don't think they had ever gotten a quantitative prospectus before because I did get four contract offers to publish my book, which put me in a really nice position, to be honest with you. Um, and in that prospectus, I also overviewed the value proposition of my book relative to the direct and indirect competition. So at least at some level, it was a compelling prospectus. And so at this point, it kind of closed out Act 1 for me, with the exception of one major oversight on my part. And what you'll see here is I really hadn't considered how much time was it going to take me to write this book, <laughs> and what was my royalty stream going to look like? And I'm going to come back to this later, and you're all business people, and maybe this is self-evident to you, but I think a lot of business people sometimes forget that they have to pay themselves a salary. And um, it's not just the idea that you're coming up with, it's is it actually going to pay you in a certain period of time, and what's that payback period? And this never entered into my mind. <laughs> and maybe it's because I'm an academic and I did have a full-time job and a salary from the university, but the fact is this came out of my nights and weekends. And I'll come back to a little bit more on this later. But that closed out Act 1 with kind of this major thing I didn't consider. Okay, Act 2 is essentially you've got the idea, you've got the backing, you've got the strategy. Now you actually have to prove that you can deliver on this idea. And so I really like complicated flow charts to task the activities. <laughs> And I think what we do frequently is we overcomplicate things a lot. And what I have here is this complicated flow chart, but down on the bottom, I have blind man's bluff, because the minute you start a new venture, it's kind of like you're blind going into this. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. And I certainly didn't. And then I have a little hangman game going at the same time, because at any time, you know, I didn't know when it was just gonna, you know, be the noose around my neck and that was gonna be it, because it was stressful. And the way that I went into the implementation or the execution of the idea was to really try to walk this balancing act between keeping the vision in mind of what I was trying to do with the book to make a contribution to the field, and then managing that against the daily details of execution. And I think sometimes we get so mired in the details, we forget to put our head up and actually make sure we're going where we want to go. And in and amidst all this, I had to also balance my life because I was teaching full-time at the university. I had research obligations to colleagues. I had two very young children. My children, when I started this process, were actually two and five, if you can believe that. And so it was a really tough time. And to balance life against these obligations was pretty hard. Um, I don't know if this is a good thing to confess in this crowd, but I said this was cathartic for me. It was around this time we stopped going to church. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. 
So, and this was a really exciting time for me to get into the writing, but it was daunting, and I really did think that I was crazy for thinking that I could actually write this book. It was like, that was the dumbest idea I ever had because I wasn't smart enough, I didn't have the content domain, I didn't have the skills, I didn't have the knowledge. And this is where having mentors was really helpful because I would call people who had previously written textbooks and they would say, you know, Jackie, if you weren't feeling that way at this particular point in time, you probably aren't scoping your book appropriately. And that's a really normal reaction to be feeling right now about this point in the process. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I did add co-authors for the second edition and the third edition, and I think all of us have to pick our business partners carefully. So I thought I'd just take a minute and talk about how I chose my colleagues to be my co-authors on the second edition of the book and the third edition. First of all, I picked people who I really respect the way they think mentally. They're good conceptually, they had excellent writing skills, and they were good on deadlines, and I had prior experience with both of them doing research. Um, I also really liked them genuinely as people. They were grounded, they, uh, you'll see the last bullet point, they love to do fun things. Each year we try to take a trip. We've gone to Alaska fishing, we've gone to Cabo to drink margaritas. One of my co-authors is disabled, he has multiple sclerosis and is a wheelchair. He goes with us everywhere and does these things, he does adaptive skiing. And so I think it's really important that you take the time to have fun with the people that you work with, because if all you do is work, it's like not fun. Um, I also think that if you bring people onto a team, um, it was really hard for me to give up my baby and say, okay, you guys are gonna be part of my book now and I'm gonna try not to micromanage you, but anybody who knows me knows that I know how to do it and what you need to do and how you need to do it. And let me just tell you for you. Um, <laughs> And so I wanted both to get their input on the book, but I needed to give them ownership of the book. And letting go of that was a really hard thing, but I think it's really important that if you're bringing people on, you need to respect that you've brought them on for a reason and give them the autonomy to do what you've asked them to do, even if it's not how you would do it. But you also have to stay true to your ideals. And so you have to know where's that line between saying, no, we're going to do it a different way. And yeah, I brought you on for a reason. You go ahead and run with that. That's, that was hard for me. I'll be really honest with you. Um, and I really like that they always felt like I was doing more work than they were. And they always wanted to jump in a little more. So that's good to have people who are willing to work really hard. So what helped me succeed with the book is every single section I wrote was vetted by an advisory board, professors around the country who are willing to read the material, tell me what I had overlooked, tell me what I needed to do differently. And I had to take my ego out of it. If you're going to ask people for feedback, you need to listen to them. And you shouldn't be defensive and say, well, the reason I did it is because of this. I mean, if they're giving you feedback, you need to listen to the feedback. Otherwise, don't ask for feedback and don't waste people's time. Um, I had a very supportive family, and although I, my daughter did say, I remember this really acutely, um, Mom, do you really like going to your office to work while Michael takes us skiing every weekend? It's like, well, no, I really don't. And Michael said to me, and this is kind of poignant and painful to share, um, excellence in your work life is great and it requires sacrifice, but excellence in your personal relationships also requires sacrifice. And I thought, oh my God, okay, I need to be home a little more. Now that wasn't funny, that was serious. <laughs> so Savannah's taking a big breath. It's like, yeah, that was honest. Okay. Um, and it did take a lot of long hours, nights, weekends, blood, sweat, and tears. And just what kept me going was this belief that this would be a contribution to the field, which again gets back to that audacity thing. Um, and for me, I had to be really clear, you know, the book could have morphed into a lot of things and I wanted to know what I was going to do and what I wasn't going to do. And I wasn't going to make an easy to kind of uh, airplane book, some people call them bathroom books. The strength of my book is that it's very thorough, detailed, rigorous, footnoted. But the flip side is it's dense, it's dry, it's hard to get through. And so you have to take a stand and know what you're going to do and be willing to stand for that because you can't do it all. And um, I think the strength of the book is also its weakness. It's dry, it's dense, it's hard to get through, but it's why it's been long lived because it's a resource tool that people actually have used in the field. And so I've owned that space and I continue to own it. Um, but I haven't been as clear about the time frame issues and I'm gonna come back to that. 
So stage three now, the final act is the resolution, evaluation, what was the impact, should you continue the commitment to what you're doing, you've executed, you've delivered, it's in the market. So here's my first edition cover, second edition cover, and third edition cover that just came out in uh, 2010. And the fact is, this has been a really great thing for my career. Um, I do feel like it's been very well received in the discipline. It's used internationally. In fact, the international sales are greater than the domestic sales. Um, I don't know that students really like the book, and there's always a little awkwardness when I teach out of my own book because people feel like they can't disagree or argue a point. But I, well, and you guys don't know, but Mario, Chris, and Jesse were all students of mine, and I just remember their, their ideas um, from a long time ago, ten, 10 years ago at least. Um, it's given me a lot of credibility, and that credibility has opened a lot of doors for me. I've gone around the world teaching high-tech marketing because I'm the author of this book. I've had consulting opportunities. I've had opportunities to do executive education. My daughter's in Hawaii today, but one day I had an opportunity to meet a group of people from Fujitsu in Japan, and we met in Hawaii, and I did a three-day training with them. And the book has opened a lot of doors for me, and so that's been really great. Um, but what's missing here at the bottom is you'll see that um, I have made royalties off of this book, but the royalties really have not been worth the time that it's really taken. If I had to monetize the hours I spent writing against the royalties, I'm sure I'm making way, way less than minimum wage. And so the ruthless clarity for me is that really the, the time and effort to do this, um, working with a publisher, despite the fact they give you market access, it's incredibly frustrating when you're a no-name author of a low-volume book is how I describe myself. I'm not Jeffrey Moore, and so I have no clout with them. And, and it's been a very frustrating relationship. Um, the impact on my family has been very real. It's very hard to stay up to date. I think we're all in moving fields, and it's hard to stay up to date. It takes a lot of time. And it's a changing industry going into e-books and new technology. And textbooks are kind of going the way of the dinosaur, really. And so, you know, at some level, this was a really great thing, and I'm really glad I did it. But it was also irrational. And it makes me feel that anybody who brings ideas to life is ultimately a little bit crazy. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I, I didn't think I was a crazy person. Um, but I think, really, it's a little bit crazy. And you have to have confidence. You have to have capability to execute, but I think you also have to be really honest about the value and the reason that you're doing it, because it is going to be a stressful situation. And um, I don't know. Um, I look back, and I'm proud of what I did, but I don't know that I would do it again, to be really honest. Okay? So thank you.